The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When the days for Jesus' being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to, to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, let the dead bury their dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. To him, Jesus said, no one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Great Evangelic Addicted Our first reading comes to us from the book of Kings, and it describes not the kings of Israel, but rather the two great prophets of Israel who do not have books named after them themselves, the prophets Elijah and Elisha. And these two prophets in the Old Testament, these two great prophets of ancient Israel, anticipate the two even greater prophets who are yet to come, John the Baptist and if we can call him a prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. The Gospels will apply in Elijah-Elisha mold to the ministries of John the St. John the Baptist and Jesus, although with an imperfect consistency. For at times, Jesus himself will be cast in the role of Elijah. However, the dominant perspective is that John the Baptist is the Elijah who is to come. It is he who wears the same garb as that cup colorful prophet wearing that camel's hair and living that wild life in the desert, calling all to, calling all to repentance. And although the, the contrast between the two is by no means absolute, in general we could say that Elijah is the prophet of judgment and justice, and Elisha is a prophet of mercy. Thus, when we think of Elijah and we look to the Old Testament recordings of his actions in Kings, we see relatively few miracles of compassion. But instead, we remember him for calling down fire from heaven multiple times, for killing all of the prophets, those false priests of the, of the religion of Baal, and for delivering oracles of death and judgment against the evil kings Ahab and Ahaziah. Elisha, on the other hand, has an extensive ministry of mercy in which he grants conception to the barren, in which he heals the sick, in which, as we recall from a few weeks ago, he brought back life to that young man who had died, in which he gives food to the hungry, purity to the poison or the defiled, and he even gives forgiveness to his enemies. And therefore, the evangelists, in looking to the Old Testament and then considering the events that were happening in their own time, they saw that there was a pattern in Elijah and his successor, Elisha, that then they saw and they saw repeated again in St. John the Baptist and our Lord. Certainly, we see in the successive ministries of St. John the Baptist that he was a prophet of judgment and that our Lord certainly fulfills that prophet of mercy. In particular, we think of our Lord's ministry in the Gospels, how they are replete with so many 
miracles that show that he is the fulfillment of Elisha, Elisha, where he, and in today's gospel, where he refuses to follow the path of Elijah, does not call down fire from heaven to destroy his enemies. The recapitulation, therefore, of the miracles of the Old Testament by our Lord in the New shows that he really is the one who has been called by God. He has that divine commission. That he really is not only going to be the son of David and the king of Israel, but he also is the prophet like Moses that all of Israel was waiting for. The one who would give them the new law and lead them to the new and eternal holy land. The great fulfillment which we await for in heaven. In the text that we just read for the first reading this Sunday, that in the, old, in, the, in the first reading, we see the radical nature of the call of Elijah to Elisha. As he throws his cloak over Elisha, we can see in that a familial gesture. That Elijah is saying to Elisha, I will take you as my son, as my heir. I will give you all that I have and you will continue my mission after I have gone. Elisha, we see, runs after Elijah and he says, let me first kiss my father and mother goodbye before I follow you. And Elijah gives him an abrupt response. He says, go back. Have I done anything to you? Which, if I could paraphrase that response, we could see that Elijah is saying, hey, do whatever you want. You are free to either accept the mission or to reject the mission to which I have invited you. We see that Elijah returns to the field, but not to kiss his mother and father goodbye. Rather, he returns to sacrifice the oxen, to cook their flesh with the plowing equipment. We want to think that this equipment, these oxen and, and, and the wood plowing equipment, would have represented a wasting of an enormous sum of money. One yoke or a pair of oxen could have represented thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars in a modern day equivalence. And certainly the plowing equipment would represent hundreds if not thousands of dollars. And therefore Elisha, in, in burning this equipment and, and in sacrificing these oxen, is certainly not only burning a bridge to his past, but he's also presenting to his family, his friends, the, his fellow workers, that he is making a definitive move. That he's making it near impossible for him to go back to his former way of life. That he is making a definitive public gesture that he is beginning a new life in an irrevocable fashion. The text doesn't quite tell us exactly what he does after he sacrifices them, but we know that he makes the decision to follow Elijah. And that decision of his is immediate, permanent, radical. Elisha gives everything to follow the call of the Lord. In the psalm, we see a prayer of comfort aimed at those who have done just this, who have made an abandonment of all other sources of earthly comforts and consolation and have committed themselves completely to the God of Israel. The psalmist identifies the Lord as his allotted portion and cup, or as we sang in the refrain, as his inheritance. This imagery comes from the practice of the sacrificial meal in which each worshiper would receive a portion of the sacrifice to eat as his own food. And therefore the psalmist in saying that the Lord God is his food and his drink is saying that he has abandoned the earthly sources of comfort and consolation, abandoned the earthly sources of, of survival, and is placing his trust, his dependency, completely upon God. Certainly this is so incredibly appropriate for us in this Eucharistic celebration. We think that God is the psalmist's food and drink. And how about for ourselves? As we gather here in our Eucharistic assembly, do we not receive from God himself the Eucharist to be our true food, our true drink, to satisfy the hungers of our hearts? This action in the psalm of the psalmist echoes, though, 
the action of Elisha in the first reading. How he abandoned his natural source for income and sustenance and food, that of farming, in order to wander off with the holy man Elijah, who has nothing but a ragged cloak and a staff in his hand. From now on, God will have to provide for Elisha. And yet, while being in this total state of dependency, the psalmist is not stressed nor frightened. He is confident that God will not let him die. He says, you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, but rather that God will grant him life, even life eternal. For he says, you will show me the path of life, the delights at your right hand forever. The apostles Peter and Paul, in reflecting on Psalm 16, understood Psalm 16 to be a reference to the resurrection of Jesus. It says, you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your faithful one to undergo corruption. And they saw this as a prophecy of the resurrection of the Son of God. And therefore we see that this Psalm 16 features prominently both in the first sermon of St. Peter on the day of Pentecost, and then also in that first sermon of St. Paul as recorded in Acts chapter 13. This therefore is a very powerful psalm for all of us to be using today in our Sunday Mass. Gathered together, we are the poor people of God. We have given up the natural delights of the world, and we have chosen to live a life that is different from the world. We have chosen to live a life that is not trusting in ourselves and in the world's comforts, but rather that is trusting in God. And we are putting our faith in God the Father to be our sustenance, we are declaring our faith that God himself will be our food and our drink and that it is he who will bring us fulfillment in life. It is he who will bring us life eternal. Certainly we see this is the will of the Lord. For as we read in the sixth chapter of St. John, that bread of life discourse, Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. This state of total dependency upon God, of trusting in God, having that faith that God will be our strength, our deliverer, our shield, our source of comfort and all consolation, is described by St. Paul in the second reading as a state of authentic freedom. A freedom that gives life and gives joy to those who hold on to the Lord in faith. A faith that allows them to be in utter dependency on God and to escape from this life of sin, from the snares of the devil, from the slavery to sin and all that temptation brings with it. One aspect of this yoke of slavery that St. Paul just speaks of in that second reading is our obsession with material comforts are making sure that we are providing for our own needs so that we will be fulfilled. This comfort of natural assurance, the comfort of knowing that our natural needs will assuredly be fulfilled is precisely what Elisha gave up to follow Elijah and is precisely what Jesus calls his disciples to give up to follow him. The Christian life is simply not successful when we are always torn between the desire to follow Christ and the desires of the flesh. As our Lord said to that first follower, foxes have their dens and birds of the sky have their nests. But if you would be my disciple, you must let go of these earthly comforts and follow me. As God says, you cannot serve both God and mammon. To be a Christian is to make the definitive statement that I am going to put to death my earthly desires so as to live the life of God, so as to live with heaven as my ultimate end instead of the many goods of this earth as my end and goal. St. Luke the Evangelist describes this calling of the Christian through several vignettes that are all kind of squeezed together into this morning's gospel. He shows how so many would-be disciples come to the Lord. And in every case, Jesus stresses the totality of the commitment being made. If discipleship to the, Eli to the prophet Elijah 
demanded that Elisha make an immediate destruction of his livelihood and total abandonment in following him. How much more does dis discipleship to the Son of God demand of all of us? We must truly ask ourselves then, have we made that radical commitment? Have we cut ourselves off from the vain delights of this world? And have we decided to follow the Lord our God with all of our minds, all of our hearts, giving him all that we are? Or are we making a half-hearted commitment? It seems that for so many of us in today's modern society, in this life that we live here in the United States, we see that there are so many efforts to package the gospel, to make it more attractive or appealing, to even Americanize our Catholic religion. In doing so, is this not, in fact, a betrayal of Jesus' own call? We find that Jesus does not soft-pedal the seriousness of a commitment to him. He does not tell his would-be followers, don't worry, everything's going to be just fine. What did he say last week? I'm going to Jerusalem to suffer and die. And at the beginning of today's gospel, he says, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem. Our Lord does not say, think it over and come back to me. Whatever works for you is going to be fine. If you want to make a half-hearted commitment, I'll make do with that. Rather, he says, give me everything. Give me all your heart, all your mind, all your strength in your love for God. And love your neighbor with everything you've got, just as you would love yourself. Perhaps the time for our half-hearted approach to Christianity is over. Perhaps we should be more forthright in calling persons both inside and outside of the church to a radical conversion of their lives, which will not be comfortable or reassuring, but which will lead to eternal life. Certainly this past week, I was had the great blessing of being able to spend the entire week with 740-some teenagers from around the diocese at diocesan work camp. And there, we were all challenged to make that total commitment of our lives. To leave behind the electronic cell phones and TVs and music, and to live a life of intentional Christianity, living in community, praying in the morning, in the midday, at lunch, in the mid-afternoon, and again all evening. And if you were one of my boys, praying all night long, an all-night vigil adoration. My guys will tell you all about that. They were very good. But making that total commitment of your life to follow Christ. I think this is the commitment which Pope Francis has been speaking about so often in his homilies. I read in one of his homilies that he said, this is salvation, to live in the consolation of the Holy Spirit rather than the consolation of the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world is not salvation. That is sin. Salvation is moving forward and opening our hearts so that they can receive the Holy Spirit's consolation, which is salvation. This is non-negotiable. You can't take a bit from here and a bit from there. We cannot pick and mix a bit of the Holy Spirit a bit of the spirit of this world. No, it's one thing or the other. Our Holy Father, Pope Francis, speaks so colorfully, but also so clearly. And so we need to ask ourselves, why is this choice so hard? For I dare say that if I were to ask you, everyone in this church this morning would say, yes, we desire salvation. So why is it so difficult to choose the way of the Holy Spirit? Why is it so tempting to live a life of Catholicism on Sunday morning and to abandon that when we get to work and people start denigrating our religion, to remain silent rather than to speak up to defend our God? Why is it so easy to skip Sunday Mass occasionally? Why is it so easy to have that half-hearted Christianity? I think Pope Francis answers that same question in his homily. He says, why do people have their hearts closed to salvation? It is because we are afraid of salvation. We need it, but we are afraid. Because when the Lord comes to save us, we have to give everything. 
He is in charge. And we are afraid of this because we want control of ourselves. My brothers and sisters, ask yourselves, when you are in control of your life, when you're the one making all the decisions and making sure that your heart is satisfied, when you're doing and living a life for yourself, are you truly happy? Do things work out well? When it's all about you, is life good? Can you save yourself and get yourself to heaven? Our Lord Jesus offers an alternative plan. He says, no one who sets his hand to the plow and looks at what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. He challenges us, each and every one of us who are confirmed members of his Catholic Church, he challenges us to accept the mission of the church, to listen to the voice of the gospel which says to each and every one of us, come, follow me, go forth and proclaim the kingdom of God. 